I want to continue our Dhamma talk on Metta, what I call loving friendliness. In fact, uh, all the four uh, sublime states, loving friendliness, compassion, appreciative joy and equanimity, all can be cultivated in three levels. Actually, two levels are uh, cultivating levels and one level is uh, uh, application level. <coughs> First level is uh, a preliminary level that uh, all uh, of us have to cultivate in order to make ourselves peaceful and happy. It is very general practice, practice to uh, apply and to live a peaceful life every day in our daily, engaged in our daily activities and uh, with people and so forth. And at that level, we cannot cultivate it in isolation. <coughs> we have to have beings around us uh, to encounter other beings in order to uh, make uh, the practice uh, more meaningful. Because when we cultivate them in isolation uh, and uh, encounter people, uh, we, we cultivate without people, then it is uh, more uh, a kind of selfish uh, practice. In order to make it uh, um, non-selfish or selfless practice, we have to be with people. Because it is when we are with people, all these four sublime states can become, uh, uh, can bring into function uh, in our talks, in our attitudes, when we do things, uh, we express the these thoughts of uh, loving friendliness in our mind. Uh, so it becomes, uh, it's a part of our life. We share it with everybody. And also uh, in our uh, personality, it becomes uh, very soft and gentle uh, behavior towards uh, one another. And at that level, we can uh, uh, use it uh, as a daily meditation practice. In fact, this is the meditation that most people do very easily. Uh, when you go to many um, you know, Asian countries, uh, this is the meditation they do every day. Because it is the simplest uh, meditation. That is, of course, uh, still a superficial level. The second level is a little higher. At that level, when we cultivate these four sublime states, we can develop uh, them up to the attainment of jhanas. First three, loving kindness or loving friendliness, compassion, appreciative joy, can, uh, develop, um, when we practice them, we can uh, develop them up to the third jhana, third absorption, concentration. How, how can we practice this as a jhana? Because whenever we think of, whenever we practice this uh, uh, loving friendliness and so forth, beings coming into our mind. All kind of beings, human, non-human and so forth. And therefore the scope is very wide, endless. However, when we keep uh, 
uh, practicing it over and over and over again, what really happens is our mind becomes calm and peaceful. That is what is called pasaddi. Tranquility arises. And tranquility is an absolutely necessary ingredient of the attainment of jhanas. Pasaddi. Then arises, as soon as the mind becomes calm and peaceful. Why, how mind becomes calm and peaceful? Because hatred, anger, resentment fades away. When hatred fades away, that is one of the hindrances. Uh, mind becomes calm. At that time, our restlessness and worry naturally fades away. And then mind becomes calm and peaceful. Uh, then we begin to see the benefit of this practice. This is why I mentioned several times it is uh, immediately effective. As we practice, we see the benefit immediately then and there. Then our doubt with regard to the benefit of meditation will disappear. Doubt with regard to the practice of loving kindness or appreciate your joy and so forth. Whatever doubt we have about their practice will disappear from our mind because we see the results. Anytime we see results of something, whatever doubt we had about that practice will disappear. That also is one of the hindrances. Then, when doubt disappears, tranquility arises, mind becomes calm, we naturally become very happy. And that happiness is not ordinary happiness. Happiness is happiness of calm and peace. And naturally when happiness arises, uh, as we always uh, mention, mind gains concentration. Sukhi no chittang samadhyati. When mind is, uh, mind is uh, filled with uh, happiness, Happiness is, uh, by the way, we must remember happiness is not uh, agitation or excitement. Happiness is just the opposite of excitement. Happiness is fulfillment. When you are content, when you are, when you are fulfilled, when you achieve something, you are calm, content. It is just like... Uh, uh, when you are hungry, you are agitated, excited. Um, you know, like um, when you see babies crying when they are hungry. When you feed, when the stomach is full, they are very calm because they are content. Similarly, when you see all this, your doubt faded away, your restlessness is gone, worries are gone, uh, your agitation is gone, resentment, anger is gone, mind becomes very calm and peaceful. What else do you need to be happy, to be content? When that happens, you naturally gain concentration. And that concentration makes your mind and body still calm and peaceful. This is how the these four these first three uh, sublime uh, practices uh, help or lead to gaining jhanas. So when you attain the first absorption concentration, which is called jhana, then we follow uh, the other steps to attain the second and third jhana. When we practice the fourth, fourth is what is called the most uh, subtle and most uh, profound sublime state, which is called equanimity. It is not very easy to practice 
mind always uh, uh, sways uh, to one side or to the other side. It is the uh, equanimity that balances everything, balances mental factors. Now, this, because of its uh, balance, it can bring us to the fourth level of absorption concentration, lead, bringing, picking up from the third, it, bring, it elevates us, uh, brings us to the fourth level of concentration. And therefore, this is the second level of the practice of four sublime states. First level is superficial, second level is more deep. And the third level actually is not a kind of draining period. Third level is just uh, putting these experiences, these gains uh, into action, into practice. That is called uh, the noble ones or Aryans uh, practice of sublime states, Aryan Brahma Vihara. Putujjana Brahma Vihara, then uh, Mahagata meditators, meditators Brahma Vihara. Meditators means those who attain jhanas, they are Brahma Vihara. And the Arya Brahma Vihara. Arya Brahma Vihara means the, the state where Aryans, those who have attained the noble state, put these experiences into practice in their daily life. It comes to them, Buddha mentioned it in many places, akichanabi, akasira labi, nikama labi. That labi means gain. They, they act, they behave. Akichalabi, without any uh, stress, any difficulty, any problem, they don't have to sit in one place and repeat what we repeat. May all beings be well, happy and so forth, they don't have to repeat. It comes to them automatically. Akichalabi. Akasiralabi also is uh, without making effort. This come to them naturally. Then, uh, akichalabi, akasiralabi, nikamalabi. It flows into their mind. Just like air goes into our body or air penetrates our pores in our body, it just passes through, just air passes through the body. These four sublime states pass through their mind. That means it comes to them just like natural breathing. And therefore, whenever we think and talk about an Aryan, we uh, automatically assume them to have these four sublime states all the time. Yet they will never be in a state of prejudice, bias their mind because their mind is always equanimous. There never will be a moment with anger, disappointment, hatred, because these all are gone because of the attainment of enlightenment. So loving friendliness is just pouring out from their behavior. They don't have to make any special effort. People love them because they love all living beings. Their compassion is always there. They don't have to wait for certain situation to arise for their heart to melt. For an ordinary person, an ordinary person has to see some uh, painful situation, suffering situation for the heart to melt, to, de to develop uh, compassion to be compassionate but they don't have to do that it comes to them automatically 
even without seeing suffering beings. Because they know all those who have not attained enlightenment are suffering. And therefore they don't have to see anybody, they don't have to encounter anybody having special pain and suffering. Because they know everybody who have not attained enlightenment is suffering. And their appreciative joy is also automatic. Whenever a, an enlightened person sees somebody striving to attain enlightenment, they give all encouragement, full support. When they hear anybody else has attained a little bit of enlightenment, they are the ones to first to rejoice it, to be happy, because they don't have jealousy. That comes to them automatically. Then they are equanimity. When they see the world in a, in a very uh, chaotic situation, they have their loving friendliness, they have their compassion, they have their appreciative, appreciative joy, even if they use all of them in their fullest capacity, they cannot eliminate all these sufferings in the world. All this chaos in the world, they cannot. At that stage, they remain equanimous, maintain equanimity. Ordinary people cannot do that, no matter how much we practice loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy and so forth, when certain situation arises, we emotionally react get upset when we, somebody may be very compassionate and when that person sees somebody else uh, ill-treating somebody, beating somebody, hurting somebody, trying to hurt somebody, try to kill somebody, this person the very with full of love and compassion will get upset and he will, this question arises very often in Dhamma discussions. People say, of course, we practice loving friendliness, compassion, appreciative joy and so forth. Suppose in front of us, somebody who is a bully, a beat somebody, what are you going to do? Are you going to sit back and uh, have compassion? Or are you going to intervene and uh, beat up these uh, bullies? What are you going to do? These kind of questions arise in our daily uh, discussions on these topics. Even the thought, this thought arises in the mind of ordinary people because they have not attained enlightenment and therefore they don't uh, have the state of uh, equanimity, uh, equanimous state of mind. Uh, now, suppose there is an enlightened being in front of whom there is some kind of situation arises like that. He would not get upset at the, with, the, with the bully. He would use all his power, all his ability to convince, to talk, to hold, to prevent, to delay bullies. He has power. He has the strength of his word is very powerful. He can talk very gently, very gentle, kind, friendly, compassionate words has enormous power, great strength. He can definitely stop this bully, bullying a weak person using his equanimous state of if he gets upset, he cannot help the, any of them. <coughs> so the difference between the enlightened beings' uh, practice, uh, application of uh, four sublime states and ordinary <coughs> person's application of sublime states, four sublime states is different. Ordinary person emotionally react. Enlightened person does not emotionally react. 
that person has enough wisdom to balance that this four sublime state, enough equanimity to balance his mindfulness. And therefore, with mindfulness, with equanimity, with wisdom, that individual will use these four sublime states. Now, let us take some examples. These sublime states, uh, uh, two of them, we have in what we call imperfections, ten perfections, parami, metta and upekka. Uh, appreciative joy and uh, karuna uh, implied even in the ten perfections. How? When one practices uh, loving friendliness, metta, the other two are automatically developing. You cannot develop only metta without compassion and appreciative joy. The one who has metta necessarily has the other two also. And therefore these two are not specifically mentioned in the, the ten perfections. So, uh, one who has attained the full enlightenment has practiced this perfection, this uh, metta and uh, upekka uh, at, the, at the perfect level. When that, when that individual, he or she, practices them and reach their perfection, then at the attainment of enlightenment, they also are they also are the, uh, the causes for that individual's attainment of enlightenment. That means they reach the perfection level, the perfected level of these uh, sublime states at the attainment of enlightenment. And therefore, that is why that person after that uh, behaved the way I explained. Now, When they practice uh, they don't uh, uh, sit back and uh, uh, just uh, experience and enjoy these things. You remember when the Buddha mm, uh, attained enlightenment, uh, he realized the depth and profundity of his teaching. It's so difficult, very difficult, not just understanding. Understanding alone is extremely difficult, but putting them into practice is more difficult. Why? Because people are so engrossed with the all kind of uh, material, mundane things, and they don't care for this sublime, noble Dhamma. So he was almost reluctant to teach. But out of utmost compassion and love for all living beings, he came out and taught. As soon as he gained uh, uh, 60 disciples, he sent them away. And this statement there is a wonderful statement. He said, Charata bhikkhave charikan, bhaujana hitai bhaujana sukhaya, atta hitai sukhaya de manusanam, deseta bhikkhave dhamman, adi kalyanam, majje kalyanam, paryosan kalyanam, sadhang sabhyanyanam, paripunnam, keval parisuddhan, brahmacharyam prakasayati. There he said, bhikkhus, travel and teach this Dhamma out of compassion for suffering being. Uh, mm, 
no two persons go on the same in the same direction on the same road that means you must sixty of you must go in sixty different areas and teach this dhamma with compassion with love of uh, loving friendliness not with any intention of uh, gaining anything never has he mentioned anywhere you go out and convert people never he said he said go out and tell this dhamma supreme dhamma for people to understand out of compassion out of appreciative joy out of loving friendliness with equanimous state of mind even somebody does not understand this dhamma does not accept this dhamma don't worry about it you just go on spreading this seed of dhamma that will bear fruit eventually you know when we think about it even today even today how it is spreading in the world not because of our powers but the power of this loving friendliness of the dhamma i must tell you when uh, we started this center uh, our neighbor wanted to uh, petition against us and um, she telephoned another neighbor who lived up there and said this uh, uh, this devil worshippers have come to our neighborhood we must uh, write a petition to drive them away from this from our neighborhood then the other neighbor has told this person now look i am glad you telephoned me first i not only do not sign this petition but i call all other neighbors in this area asking them not to sign the petition because buddhists are peaceful people they are peace loving people they are we we rather welcome them we should be ashamed of ourselves for not having them in our neighborhood <laughs> she she did not sign and this is the entire message of the buddha from the beginning up to now and into the future only on this message on this strength the buddha's teaching will survive on the strength of loving friendliness on this strength and uh, therefore buddha knowing this buddha said this is what you have to keep in mind when you go out and teach this dhamma keep this message in your mind and this is what is called the message of peace and this is the happiness of peace the taste of dhamma he mentioned in many places the dhamma has only one taste just like the water in the ocean no matter from where you taste you taste only one taste that is the taste of salt similarly no matter which part of dhamma you taste which aspect you experience which aspect you read and study you have this taste the taste of peace upasama sukha upasama sukha happiness of calmness peace tranquility so this a uh, sublime loving friendliness is the message entire message of the buddha and he said go spread this no fight no quarrel no converting let the people practice it understand it accept it live it and attain that peace so 
60 of them he sent. Out of compassion, out of loving friendliness, Buddha gave many, every sermon he delivered, he delivered with this in mind. He delivered a sermon, it sounds very like a, a very powerful sermon. We call it, um, Buddha called it Agikandopma Sutta, very long sutta. Uh, we read it in our Vandana book. And uh, thousand bhikkhus were there. When they listen to this sutta, it is said that they all attain enlightenment at the end. Well, that is very beautiful. But then he gave another short fire sermon. That was a real um, hellstone or brimstone and fire, hellfire sermon. But the sermon was very short. When he was um, walking in a forest, he saw uh, fire, forest fire. And then uh, he stepped out of the road and sat one side with other monks. And then uh, he said, because it is better for corrupt monk to burn in that fire and die than to live and enjoy the requisites given to him by people as a corrupt monk. Why? Because burning in that fire will kill him. That is the end of his life. But enjoying the, the requisites given to them by uh, people, uh, he will uh, suffer in hell for a long, long period of time. Sermon is very short, but the impact was very long, very heavy, very powerful. Sixty months, and Buddha gave the sermon, and uh, nothing happened immediately, so he went to a retreat, three months retreat. And during his uh, period of retreat, sixty months committed suicide. Sixty of them disrobed. Sixty of them attained enlightenment. When Buddha returned, he found uh, some monks missing. So he asked uh, Venerable Ananda, what happened? He said, uh, well, he, he told him the story. Then Buddha said, uh, well, it seems to be sermon is too far-fetched. So uh, let me give you a consolation sermon. Then he gave another sermon called uh, Chulla Achara Sanghata Sutta. Chulla Achara Sanghata Sutta is a very small sutra but, all, but has a very powerful effect. He said, Achara Sanghata Mattham Piche Bikkave Bikku Mettam Chittam Asevati Bhaveti Bahuli Karoti I am which will be kept a bhikkhu. Aritang ratapindang ratapindang bhunjati. Sattu sasana karo. Ova the patikaro. Kopanavadu tang bahuli kareya. That means because if a bhikkhu practices this loving friendliness for such a short period of time as finger snap during the you know finger snap time that means for a split second if a bhikkhu practices this uh, 
loving friendliness even for such a short period of time. He said, Asevati bhaveti bahuli karoti. Asevati, let the mind associate with this thought for a split second. Bhaveti, let him develop this. Bahuli karoti, let him repeat it again and again. This moment, one, today one split second, tomorrow another split second, there tomorrow another split second, split second. Practice this loving friendliness. And he said, I am Uchadi Bikkave Bikku. I call him a Bikku. So all other <coughs> unwholesome things uh, can, push, can be pushed aside if he or she practices the thought of uh, loving friendliness even such a short period of time. Then he said, Kopanavado nang bahuli karoti. Not to speak of the long period of practice of loving friendliness. If you practice long period of time, you can have a long period of benefit. He said, because this bhikkhu who practices this, aritto arittang rattapindang bhunjati, that bhikkhu, that bhikkhu's eating the requisites given by people, will not become in vain, will not become a waste, because every time he consumes the requisites given to him by people, he develops this thought of friendly, loving friendliness towards people who give these things to him. And that alone may qualifies him to be a bhikkhu. It's a wonderful consolation. Now you see, the Buddha's uh, loving friendliness, his compassion came out so quickly, so easily to console these monks, to remaining monks. So, all his life, uh, always in every incident, he expressed, he manifested this loving friendliness towards beings. There are many, many stories that Buddha, that uh, uh, illustrate the way how this, uh, uh, this worked uh, miracles. When he was going to attain enlightenment, all his uh, uh, paramis, came to fruition. There is a, a, a Nalagiri, an elephant. Elephant was uh, uh, Devadatta wanted to kill the Buddha. He uh, made this elephant uh, drink uh, alcohol. He fed him with alcohol to make him very fierce. Naturally, you know, you don't have to give alcohol to an elephant. When an elephant gets uh, fierce, he can crush a hundred people very easily. <coughs> But to make him more fierce, he fed him with alcohol. And when Buddha was walking on the street with his arms ball in hand, he let loose this elephant to kill the Buddha. And it is said that everybody on the street ran away, making the whole street, you know, abandoning the whole street the whole city like a ghost house. 
and uh, whoever saw Buddha walking on that street begged him not to walk there because this elephant is coming like a bulldozer. And it is said that Buddha stood and here is an example of Venerable Ananda's love for the Buddha. Venerable Ananda was behind, he was like Buddha's shadow. Never left the Buddha alone. He was so much, uh, uh, Buddha and Ananda were uh, of the same age. When Buddha was uh, 60, Venerable Ananda was 60. When Buddha was 80, Venerable Ananda was 80. But Venerable Ananda lived 40 years longer than the Buddha. He died at the age of 120. Anyway, Venerable Ananda was, uh, was very strong physically, very well built, physically strong person. He was behind the Buddha. And he thought when the elephant was coming towards the Buddha, he thought he would be able to stop. He tried to step forward in front of the Buddha. Buddha knew that in spite of his uh, devotion, his love, his respect and all this, he cannot stop this elephant. Buddha said, Ananda, I respect your love and respect for me, but don't try to get yourself killed. Let me handle it. So the elephant came <coughs> with fresh head, fresh ears and fresh trunks and showing his, you know, furious appearance. Buddha simply stood, stood in front of him and simply radiated his loving, friendly, compassionate thoughts towards the elephant. That's all he did. And this fierce elephant stopped right in front of him. And nobody believed it. It so. It is, a, for us, it is a miracle. Not a human being can do that. Only one like Buddha who had perfected his four Brahma Viharas, perfected his perfections, was able to stop this elephant. And this is how they apply these four Brahma Viharas when they, when they perfect them, this is how they apply at the right time without hurting anybody. The elephant or the, the, the Devadatta or anybody, nobody was got hurt. He simply stopped with the power of loving kindness. With the hatred has no power. Anger has no power. You may use very vicious, mean things to do mean things with anger for a short period of time. But it will exhaust. The loving kindness never exhausts. When it is perfected, it is boundless. Hatred has no that boundlessness. Hatred has limitations. You hate somebody and uh, love somebody. The nature of uh, this um, uh, so-called um, ordinary love and hate uh, dichotomy is that uh, uh, today you love, tomorrow you hate. You will say you love so and so because so and so is such and such. Somebody, you say I love so and so, why? If you ask, so and so has such and such an appearance, such and such a voice, such and such a behavior, such and such a, a performance, um, such and such, you have some qualities, qualifications to, to uh, make you love that person. And when those qualities and qualifications are no longer there, you say, you don't say that you love so and so. If that appearance, if that voice, if that performance, if that skill, if that such and such is no longer there, you would not say that I love so and so. And therefore, love, uh, people always say, love, hate, uh, two sides of the same coin. Surely, yes. If it is uh, ordinary, mundane type of love, it always has this duality. 
Today you love, tomorrow you hate. You love when you like, you hate when you like. You become attached when you like, you become detached when you like. All depends on your own attitude, other person's attitude and situations, your moves, ups and downs and um, depression and disappointment, uh, this and that. So, when the sublime states are perfected, or even when you practice it from the very beginning, we mentioned that from the very beginning, these are called boundless, immeasurable. In Pali, they are called appamanya. Appamanya. Appamanya means, manya means measure. Appamanya means immeasurable. You cannot measure. So, uh, when we cultivate them uh, slowly and gradually and reach the stage of in the enlightened state, in perfected state, it stays in that stage. I tell you later on in my talk, another talk, how this um, can be used as a part of uh, insight meditation. But for now, um, I don't want to go into that. So, when uh, uh, this uh, Nalagiri came, Buddha was able to subdue him because of his boundless power of loving kindness, loving friendliness. It's boundless. Another incident in his life, these are also all recorded. In, you will see hundreds of such stories in Buddhist literature. The story of Chincha. As you know, Chincha was a prostitute. And uh, one day when uh, Buddha was uh, delivering a sermon, uh, she wanted to insult the Buddha. She was, of course, was hired by uh, Buddha's uh, rivals and uh, bribed her and told her to pretend to be pregnant. So she, you know, bound a bundle of sticks to her belly and to make it look like, uh, like pregnant and put on a lot of clothes and so forth. And uh, when Buddha was delivering a sermon in front of hundreds and hundreds of people, she came right in front of him and said, you rogue, now you pretend to be a saint, preaching to all these people, now look what you have done to me. I am pregnant because of you. Then Buddha said, sister, only you and I know that. He was not upset. He was not disappointed. He was very calm and equanimous. And with his full compassion, full loving, friendly thought, he talked to her. And uh, that instant, the, she got so excited and uh, somehow this, uh, uh, you know, strings that uh, suspended this bundle to look like pregnant got loose and whole bundle of uh, sticks fell on the ground. They turned over. You see? And that very moment everybody came to know how wicked plot that was. And they all started trying to beat her. And Buddha stopped. Buddha stopped. No, no, no. That is not the treatment. The treatment is that she should understand Dhamma. That is the treatment. The biggest punishment Buddha gave. <laughs> <laughs> Teach her Dhamma. That is far better than sticks, the clubs, blows weapons. And then she will be more uh, gentle, more kind, more compassionate, more understanding and uh, will not 
do things like this to uh, kill somebody's uh, reputation, personality. Because she doesn't understand. She just was uh, brainwashed, bribed by somebody. So Buddha taught her the Dhamma. Any difficult situation he overcame with his loving, friendly attitude. If you look at his life all the time, every instant, he used to teach this message of Dhamma, peace. And therefore, Buddha, uh, when uh, uh, Devadatta, this Dhanapala, this uh, <coughs> Nalagiri, uh, Chincha, and <coughs> his own begotten son, Rahula. He treated all of them alike. His love, his compassion for all of them was equal. There was no any distinction between his son and his so-called rivals. And that is why he was able to say, because Nahang loke na vivadami loko maya vivadati. Because I do not fight with the world. World fights with me. <laughs> I have no fight. I am always peaceful. World is not peaceful, therefore they fight. They try to fight with me. With this we can, from this we can understand, when we really practice loving kindness and loving friendliness and compassion and so forth, uh, we become stronger, more powerful, and we will be able to handle very difficult situations more calmly, more peacefully. And tomorrow uh, I will speak on another aspect of uh, loving kindness. So is for Brahma Viharas. Uh, but by but uh, I think for now this may be enough as Dhamma talk. And if you have questions like last night, write them and put in the box. I'll try to answer you. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.